Okay, we are in the Explore the Bible series, the book of John. We're in session number five, and it's labeled or titled, Everyone Who Believes, and it's John chapter three. So Explore the Bible series, session five, title is Everyone Who Believes, and it's John chapter three. So, so far we have looked at the first and second chapter of the book of John. And the first chapter of John kind of divides up into two parts. The first section of John chapter 1 is what's called the prologue. And here John kind of lays out his premise for the entire book. And unlike the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John doesn't start with the birth or the ministry of Christ. He starts at the beginning, with creation, because his book is intended through a series of signs to prove that Jesus Christ was in fact God himself come to earth. So the prologue kind of lays out many of the themes that he talks about throughout the book. And then in chapter or the latter half of chapter one, he starts talking about the witnesses to Christ. So he starts off talking about the call of the disciples and their witness and how they would each, as they were called to be disciples, would go and find others who would come and eventually be disciples as well. In chapter 2, we looked at um, the cleansing of the temple. And in chapter 3, we're going to move on to an episode that happens relatively soon after the cleansing of the temple or at least while Jesus is there during that particular festival. So as I said a few minutes ago, this is the beginning of a new year. And the past year may have been good for you, it may have been bad for you, but for right now, that year is gone and we're looking forward to a new year. Now, how many of you are looking forward to something specific in the new year. For instance, they're looking forward to a trip to Hawaii out of the cold and into the nice warm breezes. So what other things are you looking forward to in the new year? New great grandbaby. New great grandbaby, okay. Two, all right. New house. New house, all right. Anybody else? Safe travels. Safe travels. Yeah. Spring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Liquid rain. No snow. Not sweet and nice. So, who makes resolutions? Anybody? I used to, but they lasted about two days and I quit. So I don't make resolutions anymore. But <laughs> try to make ones you can keep. Yeah. The the problem is. We don't always keep them. But the thing about a new year, as I mentioned a minute ago, it is a fresh start. We get a new 365 days to do something with, to fill them with activities, with time with families, with doing things. But how do we set our goals for those things that we're going to do? In today's lesson, we're going to look at the story of Nicodemus and the fresh start that he was offered. Chapter 3 of the book of John can kind of be divided into two sections. We're going to look at section 1 today. And that's the story of Nicodemus. It's a conversation. It's a conversation between Christ and Nicodemus, and it doesn't go where Nicodemus wanted it to go. I'm going to point out here in a few minutes, he came in with the idea of, these are the goals that I wanted to talk about, and instead, it goes somewhere else. The second half of the book is again a conversation, but it's a conversation between John the Baptist and his disciples pointing towards Jesus as the Messiah. And again, 
John comments on both of them. But we're only going to be looking in our studies on that first one. We won't be looking at John the Baptist. Because we've already looked at his witness to Christ back in chapter 1. So let's start chapter 3. Look at the first three verses to kind of set the stage for what's going to happen. So John chapter 3 starting in verse 1 and going to verse 3. Let's see what the stage is for this conversation. In the whole one it says, There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can perform these signs you do unless God was with him. Jesus replied, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A couple of things I'd point out to you. First off, notice how John describes Nicodemus. He's very specific about who this individual is. First off, he's from the Pharisees. So who are the Pharisees? Leaders. Okay, they were religious leaders. They were very strict, legalistic religious leaders. They had taken the Levitical law and added all kinds of additional nuances to the law and created a legal system of worship. If you did this, this, and this, then you were going to be eligible to go into the kingdom of God because they were a Jew. Notice also that he points out that he's a ruler of the Jews. So not only was he a Pharisee, but he was probably a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling religious political committee, if you will, for Israel. They were under the dominion of Rome, so that was really the rulers. But when it came to the local rulers, the local rulers were the Sanhedrin. So that's a couple of things to point out about him. In verse 2 it says, they came to him at night. Why did they go to him at night? Well, there have been a number of different commentaries There have been a number of different commentaries. Wow. Can you kick it? <laughs> I thought it was coming from outside. I did too. Oh, yeah, I don't know what that is. It's going to explode. Okay, I'll just have to talk loud. Yeah, is there a way to cut it? Ice maker that's doing it. It's not. There, you hollered at it. You like I did bond. something to it. The your, bonds. Your touch. <laughs> Kick it once. Better. Use an attitude adjuster. <laughs> <laughs> um, I point out to you that he came to him by night. And a lot of commentators have said that he came to Jesus by night basically because he was afraid of his position on the Sanhedrin. The idea was if I'm seen talking to this rebel rabbi, then it's going to diminish my standing in the community and I don't want to be seen with him. The guy who wrote our lesson today does talk about that, but he says there's another reason that needs to be considered. And that reason is that most serious discussions took place in the evening. If you were going to have a serious discussion about religion, it was generally done in the evening. Why? Fewer interruptions. People were done working. You could have some quiet time to sit around and talk. Since Nicodemus comes to him with some serious questions, either rationale makes sense. It may be a little of both. Don't know. You can kind of take your choice on that. But notice that when he comes to him, he addresses him as rabbi. That's a respectful term. That's like, you know, teacher. And then Nicodemus tries to set the conversation agenda. In verse 2 it says, 
We know you have come from God as a teacher since no one can do these signs unless God were with him. So I want to talk about your signs. You know, the Pharisees are always asking for signs. I know you came from God. So let's talk about how you came from God. He tries to set the agenda, but notice in verse 3, Jesus has nothing to do with it. He immediately jumps from Nicodemus's agenda to his. I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is one of the few places in the book of John where the kingdom of God, that phrase, is used. The other gospels use kingdom of, kingdom of God a lot. John only uses it here in chapter 3. But Jesus takes control of that conversation and changes it from what Nicodemus wants to talk about to what he wants to talk about. And that's where our lesson picks up today. John chapter 3. Let's look at verses 4 through 8. Bev, would you read those out of NIV? Yeah, you want to? I can do Amplified or New American Standard. No, NIV is fine. Okay. Four to what? Four to eight. Four to eight, okay. Uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone. So it is with everyone born from the Spirit. Okay. Point you back to verse 3. Jesus' first statement here in the conversation is, I assure you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is a literalist, if nothing else. He's a very concrete thinker. Jesus says you have to be born again. So he immediately interprets, Nicodemus immediately interprets what Jesus said in the most concrete and literal terms. How can anyone be born again when he is old? And the word old simply means adult here. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? In other words, a physical birth is what he's looking at. Nicodemus is a very, very much a literalist. He's a lot like, sorry preschoolers, two and three year olds who have no conception of symbolism or abstract thinking. They are very literal in their thinking. Well, so is this legalistic Pharisee. He's very legalistic, very concrete. This is what you said, so this must be what you mean. So Jesus then goes in verse 5, and he amplifies his statement. So again, remember what he said in verse 3. Unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus then answers in verse 5 to Nicodemus' statement, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you notice the difference between the two statements? In the first one, he says you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. In the second one, he says you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, for a Jew, particularly a Pharisee, this would have taken his worldview and basically turned it on its head. Because for the Pharisees, I'm following all the laws. I am a Jew. I am the chosen race. Therefore, I'm going to be part of the kingdom of heaven, come what may. And now Jesus is saying, uh, no. There's more to it than that. Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, some people have taken the idea of water here and said, okay, 
That means baptism. No. In context, it does not mean baptism. At this point, Jesus is not doing any baptizing. In fact, he never baptized. His disciples are the ones who baptize. But it does not refer to baptism. In the context and in the culture, what it refers to is a physical birth. And all you ladies know, they talk about the water breaking, right? Death before a birth. So they're talking about a physical birth here. Basically what Jesus is saying, just being born a Jew is not enough. And we've talked about that in some of the other uh, books that we've studied. Paul made a big point of it in a number of his epistles. Um, just being a Jew, just being born into a religious family, today, being born a Baptist, doesn't make you eligible to enter the kingdom of heaven. It takes both being born of water, both a physical birth and a spiritual birth. And in my book, my Bible, Spirit is capitalized, which generally means one of the parts of the Trinity. So, God the Holy Spirit. My, my commentary has water, <clears throat> water is to be understood as a symbol of the Word of God. Okay. okay. Don't have a problem with that either? Yeah. That's the, from the New King James. Okay. Um, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. So, physical birth gives you physical life. There has to be a spiritual birth in order to have spiritual life. It's basically what John is saying here, what Jesus is saying here. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Notice that Jesus now comes from the someone to the you. He takes it from this nebulous anybody to one person. He's talking to Nicodemus now. I don't understand that. This part, I'm not trying to read that. No, go ahead. Uh, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I don't... Okay, we're not there. I'm not done. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what that means. Okay. okay. Um, what it means is, if you're outside and you feel the breeze, you know where the breeze came from? Probably not. You know where it's going? No. What Je Jesus is using as an analogy here is the idea that you don't necessarily know where this new birth is coming from. You know that it's coming from God, but it is a spiritual birth from a spiritual being. So therefore, I don't want to call it unknown, but it's different than what we know of the known. We know what happens with physical birth. But spiritual birth is one of those unknown things that comes from a known God and only from Him. It's not something that we can generate on our own. Wind, you can generate on your own. You know, if you're hot, what do you do? You take a piece of paper and fan yourself, right? You can generate wind. You can't generate the spiritual birth. That only comes from God. And, and, and that's what they're trying to say here. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good. I'm glad I got something right then. So again, I just point out that John, Jesus starts in John talking about kind of the nebulous someone and then narrows it down to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus in verse 9 is still confused. Look at verse 9. How can these things be? He still doesn't understand what Jesus is trying to say to him. Notice Jesus' answer to him. Verses 8 through 13. Uh, Janice, would you read? Okay, what was it? 8, eight through 13. Okay. Or, no, excuse me. 
10 through 13. Okay. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay. First time... Nicodemus responds to Jesus' comment about the wind and about spiritual birth and rebirth and says, how can these things be? And look at Jesus' reply. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? In the Greek, there is actually, ours says a, but the commentary that I read says in Greek, it has actually a the, not an a. And the, the point the commentator made is that this kind of lifts him, Nicodemus, above just the normal teacher. He is the teacher. He is like a head teacher of the Jews. So Jesus is saying, if you're this really smart Pharisee who knows all the Old Testament laws and is living by them, and you don't understand what I'm saying? Verse 11 says, I assure you, we speak of what we know and what we testify and we testified of what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. Now, notice the use of the word we here. The uh, biblical scholars disagree as to what Jesus meant when he's talking here. We speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen. Who's the we? Well, some scholars say that he's talking about the disciples who are around him while he's having this discussion. Others have said it's the collected we that you see in literature a lot. The one I like, honestly, this is me, is this is the Trinity speaking. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's talking we here, the collective Trinity. I like that one better than the other two. You can have your pick of the other ones. But you do not accept our testimony. And in verse 12, if I have told you about things that happen on earth and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about things in heaven? You don't listen to me when I'm teaching down here. And I'm teaching, you know, earthly relations. How are you going to understand it if I'm talking about heavenly things? And I've been talking about heavenly things with you. And you didn't understand. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This kind of is a reference back to one of the statements that we had at the end of chapter 1 when Jesus talks about the angels ascending and descending to the Son of Man, a reference to Jacob's letter in the Old, ladder in the Old Testament. This is kind of what he's talking about here. Um, and then beginning at verse 14, he's still trying to get Nicodemus to understand what he's talking about. So in verse 14, he tries another analogy. Okay? He has tried the wind. Evidently that didn't work. So now we're going to try another analogy. Since Nicodemus is an expert on the Old Testament, let's try an Old Testament reference. So 14 to 18. Bert, would you read those? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Four? Uh, 18. Seven. Eighteen. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the God of God's one and only Son. Okay. Verse 14 in the Holman says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. In Numbers 21, 
you want to go back and find the story, Numbers 21 is the story about Moses lifting up the stink in the wilderness. And basically what happened in the Old Testament is the children of Israel were being very ungrateful. They were grumbling about Moses and Aaron leading them through the desert. They were grumbling that God had brought them out and was not providing for them as they thought he should. And because of their ingratitude, God sent poisonous snakes which bit people, and many of them died. And when the people repented of their ingratitude, God told Moses, take a bronze snake, put it on a staff, put it in the center of the camp, and if you looked at the snake, you would be healed. So that's the story that Jesus is referring to here. Now, just a little further background on it, which I didn't know, so this is a bit of trivia for you. That snake actually became an object of worship Later, in uh, Second Kings, there's the story of people actually burning incense and worshiping the snake so that the king at the time destroyed it because it was uh, an idol to the people. But what Jesus is referring to here is the idea of lifting the snake up and if you looked at it and you had faith that you looked at it and that is what's going to heal you, then God healed you. The comparison he's making here is for the Son of Man to be lifted up. Now, for us, but hindsight, we can see that as the crucifixion. For um, Nicodemus at this point, we're not to the crucifixion yet, so it makes no sense to him. But for us, looking in hindsight, we can see that the analogy of the snake being lifted up as a um, way of saving a person's life and Jesus being lifted up at crucifixion and belief in him as a way of saving a person's spiritual life. Everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, everyone here does not mean everyone. Notice what he goes on in verses 16, 17, and 18. 16 for God loved the world in this way he gave his one and only Son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have, everla have eternal life. Okay? Notice it's everyone, but there's a provision to it. What's the provision? You've got to have belief in God's Son. So it's offered to everyone, but there's a provision to it. Just like the Jews had to believe that God would heal them if they looked at that snake that was raised, people today have to believe that this is in fact God himself who came to earth in order to have a spiritual life. 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. There is no other option is basically what Jesus is telling Nicodemus at this point. <coughs> Think about the Old Testament and the cycle that the Jews went to. There is only one way to enter the kingdom of God. Go back up to what Jesus said earlier. Born of the Spirit. And S in my Bible means Holy Spirit. Means the spiritual birth comes from God himself. That's the only way to get in. And it's the belief that is important. Christianity is Okay, this is me talking. Christianity is extremely inclusive. Christianity is extremely exclusive. And that sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. Christianity is extremely inclusive in that it allows anybody of any race, any ethnicity, any economic class, anybody to accept in faith and be part of God's kingdom. Extremely inclusive. It's also extremely exclusive. 
if you don't believe, you don't get in. So extremely inclusive, extremely exclusive. And it all depends on what you do with Jesus. And I think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make to Nicodemus at this point. Now, we have no idea what happens after this with Nicodemus. There's nothing here to indicate that at this point, Nicodemus has said, has expressed any faith in Jesus as the Son of God. In fact, if anything, he's a confused Pharisee. We don't know what happens. We know later, when we get to the end of the story, that Nicodemus has come to faith and assists in the burial of Jesus in his own tomb. But at this point, there's no indication that he has come to faith. But the seed's been planted. And the seed will continue to grow. And he will eventually come. Now, a few minutes ago, when we before we started, Bill was talking to me. I'm going to use your example, Bill. Um, Bill was talking about witnessing to a Muslim. And as many of you may be aware, our church sponsors an Afghan family who are Muslim. It takes, on average, been told by missionaries who work in the Muslim world, that in order to win a Muslim, it takes a minimum of eight years. Because you can't just go in and give them the plan of salvation. Roman road doesn't work. You gotta build relationships. You gotta have a personal relationship with them and they see you and your relationship with God. And that over time, sometimes, will help a Muslim become a believer in Christ. Because they already believe in Christ as a prophet. But to elevate him to God, that's a big step for them. And it takes time. James? Yeah. <clears throat> to follow up on what James said, I, I met a Christian from Lebanon, it's a colonel and a Christian in the Lebanese army this week, and I asked him how to to witness to, how that they witness to the Muslims. Told me basically what what James just said. But then to follow up, yesterday I met a gentleman whose mother is Palestinian and his father is Hispanic. So I wondered. You know, me being inquisitive, I said, are you a Christian or are you a Muslim? He never did answer, but obviously he's a Muslim, because he said, we believe in the same God that you do and in the Ten Commandments. So it That's wasn't probably a, a diverting the answer. Yeah, so he, he, he never answered, but and it wasn't a situation where I could get in much mm -hmm. more of a conversation than that with him. But it was, these two conversations I've had this week with people, it's pretty interesting. Our, our second to the oldest daughter was a missionary Can in you Turkey. Can speak up a little bit? This our, thing's running. Oh, our second to the oldest daughter was a missionary in Turkey, and that was her heart to, um, you know, go over and share with Muslims. But she's always said the first thing that you need to do is to build a relationship, and that takes time because... Their trusting um, is not easy. Mm -hmm. So building a relationship. And then she had a family here that they actually were very, very close, had children. And so birthday parties and that sort of thing. But she said it takes many years to build that relationship before they convert. And then she said once a Muslim converts, they are the strongest witness that you can have. Because it takes a lot for them to do it. In, in many cases, when they make a profession of faith, they are disowned by family and friends and everybody. So it is a, when they make the decision, it is a, 
a life changing decision for them yeah. all or nothing all or nothing I would leave you with again I'm going to tack on the bill here I'm going to leave you with the thought that the only way to be in the inclusive side of the gospel is belief in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ but that doesn't mean that it's totally up to just that we are partners in doing that in presenting that we don't always have to have all the answers we have to be willing to give the answers that we do have to assist others in coming to that belief so that they can be inclusive as well and that concludes what we're going to talk about today any other comments? Anything you want to add? Or okay, Susan, I'm going to put you on the spot this morning. Would you close us in prayer? Sure, I will. Dear Father, we thank you for being able to gather here today. In the, the fact that we've got freedom to gather here today in the open and being able to worship you, Lord. <clears throat> we thank you for the season and the remembrance that you, <clears throat> that Jesus came to die for our sins. And we thank you so much for that, Lord. And I just pray for this group today as we go our separate ways and we go into the worship service. <clears throat> that you would go with us and guide and direct us and help us as we reach out to those around us. In these things we pray in your name, amen. 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 amen.